Are you happy today? I'm just so happy. I'm excited about what the Lord's going to do. But think about it. When we talk about fear, and that's what we're talking about this month, is this is called No Fear November. And some say that fear of public speaking. This is interesting. I'd heard this before. You may have heard someone say this, but people say that the fear of public speaking is the number one fear in life, and the fear of death is number two. But that's interesting, because if that were true, then people would be more comfortable with being in the casket than they would be in giving the eulogy. Just think about it. Would you be more comfortable in being in the casket than you would be in talking about the guy that was in there? It's interesting. But it's said that the top 10 fears in life are these. Take a look at these. Number 10 is the fear of commitment. Have you ever had the fear of commitment? Have you ever been afraid to commit? Have you ever known? Well, that's like, how about a show of hands on that fear of committing? You see, that you know, being honest about it, being open. And then the, the ninth thing is the fear of spiders. How many of you have ever been afraid of spiders? Linda does this itsy bitsy spider thing that kind of does, the kids love that. The eight, number eight, which is just so happens to be my number one, is the number eight is the fear of rejection. How many of you have ever not liked being rejected? You don't like being rejected. Well, you need to become a salesman and go door to door and sell toothbrushes. That'll do it for you. That, you know, people slam the door in your face, they won't even answer, or they've got that thing that's, that thing that's called Ring where they can see you on, their, on their, uh, their phone app, and when they see you on their phone app, they can see that, you know what, I don't want to talk to you, get away from the door. The fear of rejection will leave you when you're doing all of that. Number seven is the fear of failure. Have you ever been afraid to fail in your life? If you really go through that, just think about it. The fear of success is even worse. Number six is the fear of death. You know, I'm not necessarily so sure that's the fear of death as much as it is the fear of dying. You don't like it. It's just something you know everyone's going to pass away. We all know that. But what we're not sure about is we're not sure about how it's going to happen, and we don't like necessarily the process. It's the process. Number five is the fear of intimacy. And I'm not talking about the fear of sex. What I'm talking about is the fear of actually being completely transparent being open, wondering whether or not that someone was ever going to take advantage of you because of that. Number four is the fear of the dark. How many of you have ever been afraid of being in the dark? Do you know when there is no lights anywhere, the dark is dark. <laughs> it's just dark. It's so dark. It's just so dark. Like if, the, if your neighborhood doesn't have any street lights in it, if people don't have any lights on the outside of their house and all the, the houses are, are dark, man, it is dark. But can you imagine how dark dark really is? Because it's the complete absence of light. That's just an amazing. Number three is this, the fear of heights. How many of you have ever been, ever had the fear of heights? Have you, have you done that? That's really interesting. How many of you have ever been to um, the John Hancock building up in the Obser uh, observation tower? Have you ever been up there? That's it. Now they've got this little thing that you can walk out on. It's so, you know, you have to stand in line to, you know, almost kind of go in your pants, but you got to stand in line <laughs> to do that. And so, and they've got this little shelf, this little glass shelf that you can walk out on. Well, it's so funny because I like to watch people. I don't know if you do. Do you like, do you like to watch? I really love watching people. So, so here it is, and, and, and I'll just say that from up here. Here it is that all of a sudden you go and you're standing in line waiting to be able to go out on this little ledge. And when you see people going out on the ledge, people just don't go, oh, no. 
Here it is. My turn? Okay. And it takes them seven or eight minutes to be able to walk one foot. It just, it just takes them a long time because they're just, they have the fear of heights. See, everyone in life at some time or another has faced some vertigo. I mean, we, we all kind of, uh, you know, we, we're, we're there. You kind of get over to the edge. And it's not necessarily, I don't necessarily think it's really the fear of heights as much as I think that it's the fear of edges. <laughs> because people don't get to the edge, you know, so it's, it's like, are they afraid of the edge or are they afraid of the height, you know? So it's so like, I just kind of like take a little bit of, you know, they take a little bit of thing. Number two, then, is the fear of flying. They actually say that the reason why that they sell so much liquor <laughs> on flights is because people are just so afraid of flying. It's really funny to me, too, is that, you know, I, I of course, you know I have to fly a lot. And, and so when I go on there, a guy will, as soon as the steward or stewardess comes, the first thing he says is, he says, give me three Johnny Walker Reds. And you're like, you're sitting there and you're thinking, this guy is never going to be able to make it to the end of the flight. But because of the fear of flying, they don't really care if they don't make it to the end of the flight. They just don't want to be afraid while they're going through that flight. And then number one is the fear of public speaking. No matter what, no matter how many times you do it, no matter how many times you've stood in front of crowds of people to be able to say something, you know what my greatest challenge is? It's starting. It's not going. It's not doing it. It's starting. It's like, what am I going to say when I start? How do you start? Like, starting, you can't just kind of say something like, Hey, guys, great to see you. Let's, let's talk. You can't really do that. That doesn't really work. It doesn't really, it, it, you know, you have to say something that, that kind of means something. So let, uh, let me just say something like that. Who here has ever been afraid? Have you ever been afraid? I mean, really, just think about it. Have you ever been afraid? And every one of us have been afraid of something during our lifetimes. They never needed to teach us what it meant to be afraid. We just knew that when we faced something, whether or not that we liked it, and we called it fear. But you know, the Bible tells us time and time again to have no fear. It tells us 331 times to fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. In the book of 1 John chapter 4, beginning with verse 15, the Bible says, Whoever call shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwells in him. Now you would ask me, say, now, Pastor, why in the world do you tell us what the number is? Let me just mention to you the reason why. I know that for the way that something sounds, it's not really important to give you a number. As a matter of fact, it would almost sound better if I didn't. But at the same time, in most cases, the reason why that I do is because you have a relationship with God. And that relationship with God, you'll know exactly where something is in what God has said to you if I tell you where it is. And so that's the reason why that I do. And so here it says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him. Whoever says that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him. And he dwells in God. And we have known and we believe the love that God has for us. For God is love. And he that dwells in love, he dwells in God. And God dwells in him. 
And this is how our love comes to maturity. Really. Do you know, when you first love someone, that love isn't very mature, is it? You do love them, but it doesn't have any of the trust inside of it. But this is how our love comes to maturity, that we would have boldness in the day of judgment. Do you know, everyone say boldness. Boldness. Boldness, boldness is a huge thing. It's a big thing about life. It's a confidence. Are you confident about life? Are you confident about the things that you believe? Are you confident? Because he said that you would have boldness in the day of judgment. Today. How many of you are facing a tough situation today? You're facing something difficult. Something challenging. Something that you've got to get through. You know? And so here he said that this is how the love that God has for us becomes mature. That we would have boldness in the day of judgment. Do you know when you're facing something tough, when you're facing something difficult, you're being judged. You know, that's what's so exciting to me about the Bible. Because at the end of the Bible, the Bible actually says, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, who accuses our brothers and our sisters before God day and night. Can, I can hardly wait for the accuser to be thrown down. How about you? Anyways, there's no more accusations. We can't be accused anymore. It's absolutely beautiful. And so here, he said we'd have boldness in the day that we're going through tough time. Because as he is, so are we in this world. It's, then he says that there's no fear in love. He said because perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love, mature love, a confident love, a bold love. Do you know that God really loves you? Really. He said here, because, because fear has torment. Those problems come with torment, don't they? They come with, man... It's just another thing I've got to deal with. It's another thing I've got to get through. It's something that I have to face. And, and you know, it could have come at a different time. Do you realize that problems never come when you want them to? <laughs> because then they wouldn't be called problems. They're just something I've got to get over. But they come in clumps. They come in a gang. They come in a herd. They come in a pack. You know, it's one problem, and then, and oh, by the way, this one too. Have you ever gone through a financial difficulty during the times when you had a lot of money? No, you only go through financial difficulties when you don't have any money. It's a funny thing, but it's really, really true. I could have handled this two years ago, but today, this is my guy. I just had to get through these few things, and then I would have been okay. He said, because fear is torment, but he that fears is not made perfect in love. He said, we love him because why? Because he what? You see, I can respond with my trust. I can respond with my confidence because he first loved me. Interestingly enough, how do we get... God's word to bring change in us. How do we actually mature as people? How do we grow up as a Christian? How do we have that relationship with God? And how do we come to a place to where we really can look back at our lives from last year and say, you know, I've really grown. And what part do we have to play to make it happen? The first thing is this, is that 
you need to know that you've been given some great promises by God. Great promises. He's promised you so much and so many things. Here he tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, take a look. It says this. It says, according as his divine power. His divine power has given us, given unto us how many things? He's given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given you everything. There isn't anything that you need. God has taken care of every one of the things that you face. But how do I face it? How can I get through it? Because sometimes I feel so alone. Sometimes I face one of those fears. I might face rejection. I might face abandonment. I might face fear while I'm the fear of heights while I'm standing on top of a 14,000 foot mountain. And then what am I going to do when I face all these things? How am I going to face being alone? How do I face the challenges of life? How do I face alcoholism or drug addiction? How do I do these things? How can I actually come out of this without really almost dying in the process? He said he's given us very great and exceeding precious promises that we would become a partaker of the divine nature through these promises. He really, really has. But what do I need to know? Since I know that God has loved me, since I know that God really cares, since I know that he's really given me the victory through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, since I know that he has done all of that, you need to know, because that just stopped me inside, you need to know that God wants you to be victorious in everything you face. That's what he wants. You say, but man, it seems sometimes like it's so hard. I know. But you know, there was a woman. And Jesus actually gives us the story about it. And here it is in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse number 1. He said, Jesus told them a story showing them that it was necessary for them to pray constantly and consistently and never quit. Look at the person next to you and say, don't ever quit. Don't ever quit. Oh, yeah, don't ever quit. Verse 2, he said, he said that there was once a judge in some city who never gave God a thought and he cared nothing for people. He said, but a widow in that city kept after him. She said, my rights are being violated. She said, what you need to do is you actually need to protect me. He never gave her the time of day. But after this went on and on, he said to himself, I don't care anything for what God thinks and even less for what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding on me. Then the master said in verse number six, Jesus said this. He said, do you, do you hear what that judge, corrupt as he is, do you hear what he had to say? He had to say this, that if this woman, she kept coming to him and she kept saying to him, you give me my rights against my opponent. You give me my rights against that thing that's coming against me. You give me my rights. You let me go. You make sure that nothing is happening to me. I'm going to keep coming at you and coming at you and coming at you until you let me go. You see, God loves you. You see, he's given you very great promises. You see, he told you, you just don't give up. Do you realize, and Linda told me something that I thought was absolutely phenomenal. She said, you know, in Proverbs 13, 12, the, but when the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick, do you know a lot of times we think that that has to do when a person doesn't get what they want, that they become really pained. But that's not so much true as what it is, is that when a person gives up inside, they become sick when you give up inside. 
when you quit. You know, a lot of times people can actually have the outside look like it's right, but yet they've given up inside. They quit going after that unjust judge. They quit demanding him to give them their rights. They stop. All of a sudden you see a glaze coming over their face. All of a sudden you see that that person that was once completely joyful is now void of that joy. Has that ever happened to you? Where you gave up? Make the decision today that you won't give up. You won't quit. You won't throw away the towel until God takes you up in life. So there's a few things I just want you to know. Things that you can demand your rights for. Those things are really important for you to know because, you see, the Bible tells us, and it really is the essence of being a believer. It's almost like the hinge on which every door swings. When the Apostle Paul said that we walk by what? Faith. And not by? Faith. So you don't really walk in life by the things that you see. You only walk in life by the things that he says. That he says. So here's a few things that you can actually set inside your mind. The first thing you do is you resist sickness and disease. Don't ever get, you know, people go through difficulties. They go through sickness. They have to face issues. They face things. They've got to get operations. They've got to have all of these things for life. But yet at the same time, that doesn't mean that you need to give in to it. Even if you face difficulties, and there are many people among us today that are facing some challenges physically. Remember, God loves you. It's going to be okay. Go and do what you have to do. But whatever you do, don't go alone. Always go with God's promise. So you resist sickness and disease. You have to shake it off. Do you remember the Apostle Paul when he actually had been on his way, on his way to Rome, on his way there, he was on a ship. They shouldn't have been sailing. The ship was tossed throughout the sea. They couldn't for two weeks. They never saw the sun. They couldn't really see anything. It was completely foggy. And really for two weeks... People quit eating. They weren't, they thought that life was really over. And ultimately, the Apostle Paul comes back and he says, Listen, last night the angel of the Lord stood by me and he told me that we weren't going to die. Not a hair on your head was going to perish, but we're going to lose the ship. How would, you, how would you, if you were a ship owner, would you like to hear those words? We're going to lose the ship. That wasn't going to work. And so, Finally, they get to shore. They have to swim on pieces of wood, and it's really difficult. When they get to shore, they find out that, the, that Paul is a prisoner. Everyone lets them know. But now they were gathering sticks so that they could have a fire because they were so cold. So Paul went around and he gathered sticks. And when he threw the sticks on the fire, the Bible says that a serpent came out of those sticks and out of that fire and attached itself to Paul's arm. And when it attached itself to Paul's arm, they said to themselves, all of those people of Melita said, that you know, although he was able to escape the sea, yet fate would not allow this man to live. And so when that serpent attached itself to his arm the Bible says that he shook it off and when he shook it off they wondered what was going on but then they expected him to die and when he didn't die they said this man is a God that's really what he is but it wasn't true it was that Paul had a promise from God 
He knew that God loved him. He knew that God had a future for him. He knew that everything was going to be great. And you have a future. You have something that's about to happen for you. Everything is going to work out in your life, whether it be sickness and disease or anything else. It's all going to work out for you. Say this after me. I, I have determined to shake off sickness and disease. No matter how I have to do it, at the doctor's or at home, I'm going to shake it off. The second thing is this, is that you need to resist fear. You need to resist all fear in your life as though it was a fire. How many of you have ever had a fire in your home? Do you ever have a fire in your home? You know, you know we, I guess, we had a little one. How many of you have ever had the fire department come to the house? Oh, yeah. Aren't they awesome? <laughs> you know, the, you see when they, get out, when they get out of the fire truck, man, they come out of the fire truck, they got their boots on, they got their coat on, they got their fire hat, which I think they, they got to turn it around, right? They got the fire hat. It's kind of like this. It's not like this. It's kind of like this. And so they got this fire hat on, man, and they run. And what's the first thing that they've got in their hands? The fire axe. You know, before I was a Christian, I actually stole one of those once. I actually, after I got to be a Christian, I took it back exactly to the same place that I took it from. After I, it was really funny. I thought, I didn't think it was so bad in trying to get it out of the building when I was taking it, but trying to get back in the building, that was the problem with me with the axe. I, that was my problem. But, you know, so here it is that you see them getting out of there. You know, there's, a, there's all of this smoke in the house, and they're not knowing what to do. So immediately what they want to do is break out windows, break down doors. They want to do all this, start you know, chopping into walls. They want to start doing all this kind of stuff. So in order to get them not to come, what you're doing is you're running all over the place trying to figure out how do I stop this fire on the stove? So you're thinking, water. Why did you say that? You know, <laughs> well... I've done water before. The only problem is, is that when you throw water on grease that's on fire, it's like kaboom. You know, I mean, it's, it's like it, it gets bigger. But then all of a sudden, you're, you're running around, you're thinking, well, you know, do I need a dry cloth? Well, dry cloths don't work. Well, how about like a wet cloth? Well, wet cloths don't really work so much either because by that time that it takes you to think all of that stuff, there's a greater fire than you thought your little towel could handle. So you have to figure out the way to be able to do it. And that's the way you have to deal with fear. You have to do whatever you can do to get rid of that stuff. You get rid of it. You, you don't let it stick around. Once fear seats itself inside you, it wants to live with you forever. And then people can say about you in years to come, well, you know, they're afraid of heights. Oh, they're afraid of the dark because it stayed too long. Now what we do is we welcome fear to stay. We say, let me get you a nightlight. Oh, you don't ever have to go up on the ladder. We'll take care of that for you. And they make provision for the fears inside of your life. You see, you need to resist all fear and depression as though it was fire. Number three is that resist lack at any place. You resist lack. Say, God loves me. God loves you see, there's so much difficulty in the world that we have to become the answers to society, not the questions in society. You need to do well because there are so many people you know that aren't doing well. You need to do well to be able to help other people who aren't doing as well as you are. You've got to, you have to win. You've got to succeed. You've got to have more than enough 
to be able to help people who don't have more than enough. So resist financial lack. Resist it as hard as anything else. Find a way to do better at your job. Find a way to get yourself a new business. You know, I was talking to someone yesterday. I actually went there to, to their place of business. And as we were talking, what they were telling me was, was that if, the, if they ever had one thing in their life that they wanted, they wanted to be able to get free from not having enough. They wanted their wife to be able to stop working as much as she was working. And I said, well, I said, how old are you? And he told me that he was 44. And I said, do you know the only difference in between you being 44 and 54 is going to sleep and waking up? What are the kind of things that you think that you can do in order to be able to help your wife not to work so much so there's no more, not so much stress in the family? Not so many things that really are standing against you guys becoming stronger in your marriage and becoming greater parents. I said, have you ever thought about an online business? He said, you know, I've never thought of that. I said, you know, there are people that can teach you how to do all of that stuff. You just have to be willing to learn. Don't ever stop. Don't ever quit looking for the crack in the door. Don't ever stop thinking that there's a way out because you can do it. Yes. You can do this. You can really make it. Yes. The next thing is this, is that resist attack. Do you realize no matter what it is in your life, whether it's strife, whether it's disunity, whether it's you not getting along with somebody, no matter what it is, just resist it with all of your, with all your life. Just resist it. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11, the Bible tells us this, lest Satan should gain an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen. You have to realize the very thing he wants to do is he wants to break you apart. He wants you to be distant from other people. He doesn't want you to actually believe the same thing. And when you believe the same thing, always make sure that when you believe the same thing, that you really have a reason from God's word to be able to believe that. Don't let it be that you both like the same wine and that's what gives you the unity or you both like to go hiking or you like to bowl you know, or you like to go out and play pool or have a few beers. That's not the reason why that you come together with someone. Always have a real core belief system in life with people. Because Satan wants to take an advantage over you. So don't be ignorant of his devices. And then lastly, is resist all care. How many of you have ever worried about something in your life? Have you ever worried? I know, everyone but you, Mr. O'Manil. You see, resisting care, resisting worry. Don't be worried about it. Forget about it, actually. The Apostle Paul told us something that is just absolutely so beyond the charts. He said in Philippians 4, verse number 6, he said this. He said, don't worry about anything. He said, don't worry about it. Forget about it. You know, I talked to, I talked to forget about it's son this morning. Just forget about it. This fellow that I know, that's all I know is his name. I, I just learned his name this past week. His name is Louie. Oh, yeah. But Louie, I thought Louie's name was actually forget about it. Because every time that I'd see him, all, all Louie would ever tell me is, just I'll forget about it. Just forget about it. So in life, you just need to forget about it. Amen. Don't worry about it. But in everything, in everything, Everything you face, all the challenges you face, all the difficulties that you face, all the things during the week that you face at the job, in your home, with your kids, with your friends, with the bank, you know, all those things that you face, it says in everything, 
by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Like Lloyd said this morning, what it is, is that we, th we thank God first. We thank him before the problem. He said, and so the apostle Paul said that. He said, with thanksgiving, he said, let your request be made known to God. He said, in the peace of God, which passes all understanding. You know, did you ever see a, a quarterback throw a pass and the guy, the receiver, was out there, man, and he was running and running and running, and yet at the same time, that pass was just beyond the reach? Did you ever see that? Yeah. Almost kind of feels like that there was a loss, but that's the way that peace is. Because the picture it gives us is it gives us the picture of a quarterback who actually throws the pass. And when he throws it, although you inside your mind, you might be running, 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 running to try to gain all the understanding, the peace will go just beyond that very place where you can think of. That peace which passes all understanding will keep your heart and will keep your mind in Christ Jesus. This morning, my desire was to only tell you about how that you don't have to have fear in your life. You don't need to be afraid anymore because God loves you. You don't need to be afraid of sickness and disease. You don't need to be afraid of financial lack. You don't need to be afraid about anything in life because God loves you. And he's given you promises for you to be able to hold on to that when you hold on to those promises, those are promises between you and him, not necessarily between you and another person. He won't let you down. He'll never let you go. You don't need to be concerned. He's going to work it all out for you. Everything is going to be fine. Everything is going to be fine. Let's bow our heads and pray together. You might be here this morning and, and really, my job isn't here to be able to condemn anybody. It's to encourage people. It's to be able to love people. But I want to ask you about your relationship with the Lord. Whether or not that you have one. God sent Jesus to be able to pay the price for everything for you and I. Sickness and disease, sin. And he told us that if we would believe in Jesus that we would never perish but we'd have everlasting life. Or maybe you're a Christian and your heart has grown cold toward God. You could say, you know, I already am a Christian. But has your heart grown cold toward God? Have you been living in unforgiveness with others? That's a question. Today is your day to answer that question. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about what you're going to do. And what I want to do today is I want to pray with, with all of us, but especially you. Because Jesus said, he said, if you would confess my name before men, I'll confess your name before my Father who's in heaven. So let's all confess the name of Jesus. And if in fact your heart's been cold, or for the first time, you're really making a commitment to God. Then at the end of the service, you can go out to the information booth that's outside the doors here and become part of the family. If you're a visitor, of course, we want you to do that. But also, if your heart's grown cold, especially 
if you've been around the church for a while, if your heart's been cold, it's time for you to just come back. Say, let's all say this together. Father, Father in, the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I am so grateful, so grateful that, Jesus paid the price that Jesus paid the price for me. For me. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord for, forgiving me for forgiving me and for cleansing me. And for cleansing me. I, choose I choose to repent. To repent. I change the way that I think. I let, it go. I let it go. Jesus Christ, you're the Lord of all. Jesus Christ, you're the Lord of all. And the Lord of my life. Lord of my life. I'm, so I'm so grateful for all that you're doing. For all that you're doing. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to welcome you to the family of God. And also, if your heart was cold, it's time for you to let the love of God come back through your life. When we come back tonight, and I'll tell you this in just a minute, but I'll just tell you what I want to do because I was excited about it. Tonight, of course, I want you all to come back. But when we come back together tonight at 5, I'm going to talk about how to have no fear in front of the people that you respect. Very interesting. It's going to be an interesting subject.